Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you joining us for today's webinar, which is brought to you by the Phil Fisher Privacy, Security and Information team. My name is Phil Lee. I'm a partner in the team and today's topic is from Marriott to Morrison's important lessons from recent data security cases. Now, the majority of today's session is going to be brought to you by my cybersecurity specialist colleagues, Kirsten Whitfield, uh, who is a legal director in our team, and Saba Mirza, who is a senior associate. But before we delve into the detail of today, let's first take a look at the agenda. Could you move forward on slide? Thank you. So what we're going to cover today, we are going to look, um, to begin with, at the threats that exist to businesses out there, the cybersecurity threats that are out there, and the associated risks they create for business, both in legal terms, but also in terms of wider big business risks. I'm going to look at data breach notification requirements, including a recap of the GDPR's requirements for reporting to regulators and to affected data subjects. And we are going to look at post-GDPR enforcement trends, what have the regulators been doing? And then finally, to close out today's session, we are going to look at some of the key data breaches that have occurred and been in the press and what we can learn from them. Now, if we have time into the end of today's session, we will ask a few questions. So if you have questions as we're going along, please do pop them into the chat box and we will endeavor to address them at the end if there's time. If there's not, then we will follow up with you in writing after this session. Now, in terms of the cybersecurity threat landscape, there was a survey that was recently published by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, which showed the percentage of organizations that have had some kind of cyber breach or attack in the last 12 months. And it's a fairly whopping 46%, that's almost one in two businesses overall, reported having some kind of cyber incident. And it seems that the bigger the business you are, the more likely it is that you are to experience a cyber incident, perhaps not surprising, Bigger, bigger organizations are more likely to be attractive to cyber criminals. And in the survey, it reported that 75% of large firms had had some kind of cyber incident. Now, if you look at what those kinds of incidents are, Saba, could you move forward one, please? You will see that almost two out of three um, cyber, incidents being, cyber incidents being reported were phishing attacks fraudulent emails uh, being sent to staff or uh, employees being directed to fraudulent websites, which is kind of interesting because when we t tend to think of cyber incidents, we often think of viruses or malware or of some hacker sitting behind a machine breaking into our computers. But the great majority of cyber incidents, incidents that we see are actually fraudulent emails and fraudulent websites, phishing related attacks. So with that in mind, we, before kicking off the, the detail of today's session, we wanted to run a question past you as attendees to see what your own experiences have been. So we've got a poll that we're going to run and we're just asking, has your organization suffered a phishing attack in the last 12 months? Now, just in case you are worrying, don't worry, we are privacy lawyers, uh, so all the results are anonymous. We're not gonna be calling anybody out, but um, we'll give you a few seconds to respond to that and then we can see how that matches up with the uh, with the survey results we were just looking at. And Sabra, I'm going to hand over to you once we have those survey results in. So there you go, very closely representing what we were seeing from the from the, the study from government there. 57% of respondents on this webinar indicating that they've had some kind of phishing attack in the last 12 months, so a very significant number. Saba, passing to you now. Thank you, Phil. So I'm first going to take you through the risk landscape associated with a data breach. Now, the obvious risk that always comes to mind when dealing with the data breach are, of course, the hefty GDPR fines that we always read about in the press. However, there are other risks that you will need to deal with during the life cycle and the aftermath of a data breach. For example, initially, when you've suffered a data breach, your business has suffered a data breach, you will have to deal with the disruption to the business. 
you will also have significant costs, which is also a risk, um, as it's unexpected expenditure associated with investigating the breach, any measures you implement to mitigate it, and of course, the engagement of lawyers and forensic experts. Now, when you deal with the aftermath of the breach, and this is particularly when a breach comes into the public domain, you of course have the impact to the business itself, and that can have a various number of risks associated to it, such as falling share prices, loss in consumer confidence, and reputational damage. And another rather prevalent risk is dealing with complaints from data subjects, those who have been affected by the breach, and court actions such as class actions, which, as we can see through cases which Kirsten's going to take us through later, are very much on the rise. Now, here are some results from a survey that IBM did recently, and it's their report on the cost of a data breach. Now, this was done earlier this year, and 524 organizations across 17 countries took part in this. Now, we can see here that the average cost of a data breach in the healthcare sector is a whopping $7.13 million. Now, looking at the affected data sets in the context of a breach, 80% of breaches relate to records containing customer personal identifiable information. And the average cost given to each customer record in this context is $150. And looking at other enterprises, sort of this is more generally outside the health sector. So the average total cost of a breach um, at enterprises of more than 25,000 employees um, are on average 5.52 million. Now, looking at the chart we have towards the right of the page, which shows us how this average cost of a breach is split up. And this does sort of marry up with the risks I just um, took you through a moment ago. Now, you initially have some of that cost apportioned to the loss, um, loss business cost. And then, of course, there's the detection and escalation and dealing with the breach. The third category is notification. And lastly is obviously any post-breach response that we have. So that's roughly how the costs were split up. Now, sort of a quick um, recap here. The risk landscape under the GDPR obviously relates predominantly to fines, as I said. There's two categories, broad broadly speaking. 4% of global annual worldwide turnover or 20 million euros, whichever's higher off the both. And that could be given for breaches of Article 51F and Article 58.2. The second category is obviously the lower categories of fines, 2% of global annual worldwide turnover or 10 million euros, whichever is higher. And that relates to breaches to do with articles 28, 32, 33 and 34. Now, before we sort of de um, dive deep into the various notification requirements, let's just sort of go back to basics and see what the data, what the GDPR says about personal data breaches. So a breach of a, a personal data breach is a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data transmitted, stored or otherwise processed. And that's, of course, the definition from Article 412. And again, a quick recap here of the breach notification requirements under the GDPR. So if you are a data controller and you have suffered a, um, a breach, you have no, potentially two notifications that you may need to make. The first is obviously to the regulator, and that would happen if it is likely that the breach will result in a risk of harm to the data subjects. You will need to make this notification without undue delay and, any, and in any event within 72 hours where feasible. However, the exception to this is you don't need to notify where it is unlikely that the breach will result in a risk of harm to the data subject. So that's the threshold we're looking at. The second notification you may make as a data controller would be to data subjects. And that is triggered if the breach is likely to result in high risk of harm to data subjects. And this should be done without undue delay. Now, there's three different exceptions to this, and I'm going to provide you with an example for each. The first is unintelligibility measures. 
for example, uh, let's take phishing attacks, for example, a bad actor has sent this phishing email and you're fallen um, victim to it and they've accessed your systems. Now, if the system is encrypted and the encryption is so strong that they actually cannot access the data held, um, then the data is re rendered to be unintelligible. Therefore, you don't need to notify because they never really saw what the data was. The second exception is where a high risk to data subjects is no longer likely. So an example of this, let's say you publish a customer database online in error um, and it's on the internet. However, you realize this mistake within minutes and you take this customer database down. Now, if you have sufficient logs and when you go back and you check them and you actually see, well, no one actually, no visitor landed on the particular page where we'd made that um, you know, in, inadvertent disclosure of the data. So if nobody has accessed the data, that risk that we saw may exist no longer does. So in that scenario, no notification will be required. And the last one is disproportionate effort. And this is one we tend to come across quite commonly. So this is usually where you don't know who the data subjects are. As a controller, you have put significant time and effort into your investigation to find out, but it's still impossible to identify the data subjects and notify them individually. So then you can make an alternative notification in this scenario, and that would be um, to publish a statement online, notifying them of the breach and providing any mitigation factors if necessary. And then lastly, data processors, as we know, are also required to notify a data controller of a data breach. And that's just when it um, occurs, it's not for the data controller to decide, sorry, data processor to decide um, which breaches they notify, which they don't. And that notification should be made without undue delay. Now, Obviously, something that has consumed our life and really affected us since March is the pandemic. And this, of course, has had an impact on um, a number of items. You know, how the regulator deals with cybersecurity breaches is just one. So what happened at the start of the pandemic, and rightly so in a way, was we saw quite a lot of press. Um, highlighting the particularly increased risk of phishing attacks. And this did, in fact, actually end up transpiring. And we have seen some evidence of this in the work that we have done with our clients as well. Um, and the ICO actually published a statement at the start of the pandemic on their approach to breach notification. Now, the ICO have maintained that even during this time, a breach still should be notified without undue delay, and this should be done within 72 hours of the organization becoming aware of the breach. So here, essentially, they have reiterated what the legal requirement is. However, the ICO have said that they acknowledge that the current crisis may impact this, so there may be some delay and they will assess each report, each notification made to them on a case-by-case -case basis, taking an appropriately empathetic and proportionate approach. Um, they have actually gone on to say that they will take a very strong approach against organisations who breach data protection laws because they're trying to take advantage of the current crisis. So just something to have um, at, at the back of your mind. I, my reading and my take of this is that you still stick to what the GDPR says and you endeavour to comply with that even in these tricky times. So this slide here again, we're going back to um, IBM's report on the cost of data breaches that was done earlier this year. And this is looking at, they asked some questions to do with the pandemic as part of their report and they're specifically linked to home working. So how would remote working impact the cost of a breach? 70% of organizations that responded to this question said it would increase the cost of the breach. I think that's quite sensible given it may be much trickier to investigate and deal with a breach um, as it would be if you were perhaps on your premises and had access to a number of things. Also, the risk is much higher at this point in time as well, which bad actors could exploit. The other statistics they gave were that 54%, um, so this is the share of organisations that required remote working in response to COVID-19, which reflects, I guess, our sort of working patterns at the moment as well. We saw a lot of organisations shift to working from home. 
Um, in terms of the share of participants who said that remote working would increase the time to identify and contain a breach, sort of touching on the point I said earlier, was 76%. And the share of participants who said that remote working would increase the cost of a data breach, as I said, is 70% as illustrated by the diagram. Now, over the next five slides, um, you're going to see sort of a number of graphs. And this is data that we've collated from various sources, including the Euro European Prote um, Data Protection Board. Now, these all relate to enforcement actions, but there's a couple of points that I want you to bear in mind before I take you through the figures. So we're looking at trends in all enforcement actions. So this is stuff going over and beyond data breaches. So there may be an enforcement action here for failure to comply with the data subject rights request. Um, it, these figures do not include any notice of intent to fine for a data breach. So it will not include the um, proposed intended fines by the ICO for BA and Marriott. It's also worth noting that regulators operate in a very different way across the EU when it comes to publishing um, stats on data breaches um, or enforcement action more broadly. Um, they don't always publish all of them. So these aren't a complete set of figures um, and statistics here, but it's enough to highlight sort of the key trends. So this first slide here, we're looking at the overall sum of fines cumulative and so initially up until December 2018 we see that it's pretty steady it's been very quiet on the enforcement front and then in January 2019 we see sort of a steep um, spike and what happened in January 2019 was the Canils fine um, when they fined Google uh, 50 million um, euros and then after that, we broadly speaking see quite a steady increase, um, but we can see that fines are generally up, um, on the rise. Come March 2020, we see sort of a slower increase. This is due to the pandemic. And in June 2020, where restrictions are now starting to get lifted, we're now seeing regulators sort of come to life again. Not that they weren't working on things in the background, but during the pandemic, their focus was, um, I guess, perhaps elsewhere, especially with items like track and trace. Um, but now they're on the rise again, and that's what we'd expect to see in the future. Now, this next slide looks at the overall number of fines, again, cumulatively. Um, again, we saw no real activity up until January 2019. And again, that's a given in the sense that it took organizations a bit of time to grapple with the GDPR and implement everything. Likewise, it would have been the same for regulators, but there's a very clear trend here. There's a steady increase in fines and we can see this um, continuing in, in the future. This next slide looks at the countries with the highest fines and I've just picked out the top five and then added the UK um, for illustrative purposes. So we can see that um, the um, data protection regulator in Italy, France and Germany, they're the ones that send, um, give out sort of the big, um, big money fines. Now, as I said, in these stats don't include any intention to fine. Um, if for the UK, we were including BA and Marriott, then that would be well off the charts here. And then the next item here looks at countries with highest fines by the total number of fines. So we can see Spain as a regulator tend to give out quite a lot of fines, but generally they're low value fines. Um, we actually, um, during sort of an internal um, know-how session, our, one of our colleagues um, gave some intel on how the Spanish regulator is operating at the moment. And I think it's worth um, sharing with you today. So what the Spanish regulator has done is they've introduced a mediation style body to deal with enforcement action. So I think what we're likely to see as a result of that is a decrease in the number of fines that um, the Spanish regulator hand out because organizations subject to any sort of action would not be dealing with the regulator. They may, dealing with, they may be dealing with this regulate, um, mediation body instead. Um, so I think it would be interesting to see what, how these trends change in the future. Again, sort of with the UK still sort of relatively low at the moment in terms of number of fines given out.
Now, this next slide focuses just on the UK. So the former four slides focused on the EU um, trends broadly. And here what we've done is split up data breaches per sector and we're looking at cyber and non-cyber um, related incidents. It's, I mean, it's quite clear that it's the non-cyber related incidents that are more sort of prevalent. However, in, in the press, cyber related incidents, um, such as, you know, your hacking and ransomware attacks seem to attract more of the uh, media attention, which is quite disproportionate as a lot of the um, and breaches are likely to relate to things like you know human error an employee cl clicking on a phishing email or an inadvertent email being sent elsewhere so the non-cyber related issues so i felt that was quite interesting to highlight and i think now it's over to kirsten who's going to take us through some key enforcement actions yeah great thanks Saba. so um I was going to start with Morrison's um, and first going to take a look at what happened and then move on to some lessons learned. So um, very briefly, um, it, back in 2014, so this is pre-GDPR days, um, Andrew Skelton, their internal auditor, was disgruntled and he leaked the payroll data of about 100,000 of Morrison's staff. And about 5,500 approximately of those brought a class action claim. In 2017, this was in the High Court um, in the UK, they decided actually there wasn't a breach of the Data Protection Act 1998 security requirements. So this is, as I say, it's pre-GDPR, but the security requirements are, are pretty similar. But what they did also say is that despite that, Morrison's was still vicariously liable. So despite the fact that they did everything right from a security perspective, they would were still held liable for what their employee did. This went to the Court of Appeal and in 2018 the Court of Appeal agreed with the High Court and then just in April this year the Supreme Court uh, very sensibly unanimously overturned the High Court's decision to find that Morrison's shouldn't be vicariously liable you know, given, given all that they'd done anyway. So what lessons can we learn from Morrison's? Well there's the obvious lesson which is you know get your security right as they did in this case. Uh, making sure that your access controls are in place and they're regularly reviewed is also very important. So in this case, actually Morrison's got their access controls right. So Andrew Skelton was perfectly entitled to access this payroll data as part of his job. He was their auditor and also entitled to disclose it. So they hadn't done anything wrong there. But what can other organisations learn from this? Um, now, do what you can to prevent the human error factor, is what I would say. So Morrison's was not vicariously liable in this case because first off, Mr. Skelton's motives were malicious. And secondly, um, what Mr. Skelton do, did was not within his role. So there was a, a break in the chain in terms of what he was permitted to do as part of his job. The outcome could have been very different for another organization if actually you hadn't set the correct access controls or had the right security in place. Or what if the employee in question had just made a mistake? So what if they, um, let's take the payroll details example, what if they uh, are doing something with it perfectly within the role that they're supposed to do, but say they accidentally um, send it to someone that they shouldn't have or give access to someone outside of the organization. Now that's within their role and um, arguably there, there isn't a break in that chain in terms of role um, and they didn't act maliciously. So the outcome there could actually be different. You could be held vicariously liable still for what your employee does. The next slide, please, Sabah. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to have a look at Lloyd and Google as well. So what happened here? So in this case, this was a class action uh, claim by Mr. Lloyd against Google. And this is in the English courts, and this all relates to the um, Safari workaround and affecting about 4.4 million Apple iPhone users. And the Safari workaround all centered around the placing of cookies and, and um, knowing about it and giving consent to it. 
Now, this is an interesting claim because it's a representative claim, which actually means that you don't need to opt in to the claim. So everyone is in the claim automatically without needing to actually opt into it. But what you do need for a representative claim is some sort of common interest. So you have to all have the same interest. And in this case, what Mr. Lloyd alleged is that uh, the interest that everyone had was the loss of control of their data. And it wasn't a claim being made on the basis of damages that people suffered, because actually the, what the damage they suffer could have been different from, a, from claimant to claimant. Now, the High Court initially dismissed this claim, but when it went to the Court of Appeal, they disagreed. And they said, no, actually, loss of control of your data, that is enough for a claim. And not only that, but you do not need to prove your financial loss or your distress. Now, this is um, the, the Supreme Court has granted Google permission to appeal this, um, so we, we need to watch this space. But based on what the Court of Appeal has said, let's look at the lessons learned from Google. Now, you might be asking why I'm talking about this case, because it's not a data security breach case, but, but actually there are some lessons that we can transfer because there are implications for breaches. So what if there had been a personal data breach um, and there's a representative claim that could be brought? So the first um, lesson learned here is that you need to be mindful of the fact that as long as everyone has the same interest, so this loss of control of their data, they don't actually need to prove any damages or financial loss. The reason this is really key for security breach cases is because in these types of cases, it can be, it's really difficult sometimes to prove that um, as a result of a breach, you personally have suffered any um, losses directly as a result of that particular breach. You know, particularly with nowadays how often um, there are breaches. So, so the fact that you don't need to prove your damage or loss is quite significant. But the court also mentioned that there has to be a threshold of seriousness. And they also said, it would undoubtedly exclude, for example, a claim for damages for an accidental one-off data breach that was quickly rectified. So what we can take from that is that it's also really important to act quickly to mitigate and rectify breaches. That's if you can, of course, because it's not always going to be possible. You know, a malicious disclosure or exfiltration of your data, you're not getting that data back. But what if it was this accidental say, um, sending of payroll data to someone who shouldn't receive it. You know, if you could act quickly there, you could um, cut off their access to the data or get the data back, confirm it's been deleted, um, get the person who received it to confirm they'll keep it confidential. So there, there are things that you potentially could do to mitigate and, and rectify, um, and that would then sort of get you out of a whirlwind of trouble. So on to the next slide. Right, we're going to talk a little bit about British Airways as well. Um, what happened here? So this is the um, case where British Airways website traffic was diverted to a fraudulent site and impacted around about 500,000 of their customers. And BA told the ICO about it in September, although they, they thought the breach probably started in June 2018, but they notified in September 2018. So in July 2019, the ICO announced their intention to fine BA 183.39 million, which is around 1.5% of their worldwide turnover. So this is really, you know, quite quite um, unprecedented, very 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 high fine. Um, and actually, and I'll add to that, um, in July, just very recently this year, IAG has issued their half yearly results. And we see from that that BA have reserved 22 million euros for the for the data breach. So um, if that's what they're anticipating actually getting fined, that's really quite a significant reduction. So what lessons can we learn from BA? So as I said, this is what this is not an actual fine as yet or an ICO decision. But what happened is that they released a press statement and an intention to fine. And from that press statement, there's some things that we can glean. First off, we can glean that, um, you know, security measures, as always, very important. Um, and BA didn't get this right on, for their website. But what we can also glean is, from the ICO statements there is that 
um, BA had cooperated. So, so actually, reading between the lines, it could have been even worse for BA had they not cooperated with the ICO. Um, and you might well be thinking, well, you know, maybe they just always say that, but it doesn't really make any, much difference. But when, when I've looked across um, other fines in other countries to look at trends in terms of fines, it's quite interesting how many times you see um, within um, statements from the regulators where they've issued a fine that actually it's been exasperated by a, an organisation not playing ball with them. Um, and, and I do wonder actually even whether some of the fines could have been completely avoided had um, the organisation cooperated with the regulator. Now just as an aside, this is an example of the one-stop shopping operation. So you've got the ICO taking the lead on this investigation um, and they said in their press statement that, that others, other regulators will have the chance to comment. Now the decision here um, on this was due in March uh, 2020, so this year, and that was already the extended time frame. And the decision's been extended again, and that's due to um, COVID. And it will be very interesting to see whether the actual fine um, that BA get, if they get a fine, um, is that much lower figure that they're anticipating, so around the 22 million uh, euros. And I wouldn't be surprised if the ICO actually, uh, you know, if when they do issue a fine, um, they do reduce it to take into account BA's circumstances, because of course the um, the airline sector and some other sectors have been really hard hit during the pandemic. So now taking a look at Marriott, what happened here? Well, um, well, actually, it, this was a an incident that happened at the Starwood Hotels back in 2014. So this is pre-GDPR, and Marriott acquired the Starwood in 2016. And they discovered that there'd been that there was a security incident, and in 2018, and they notified it to the ICO in the, in in 2018. And uh, it's about 339 million guest records that were affected here. And the ICO, um, again, this was an intention to find that they um, announced in a press release back in July 2019, so around the same time as BA. And uh, the intention was that they were going to find just under 100 million euros, so 3% of worldwide turnover. So that's even higher than the sort of BA uh, percentage of worldwide turnover. And what we, we saw from the um, press release is that this all related to failures to secure systems. So this, we're talking here about Starwood systems, um, but then failure by Marriott when they acquired the Starwood to undertake sufficient due diligence. So what can we learn from the press statement? Because as I said, this is not an actual uh, final decision as yet, but we can deduce a few things from the intention to find that was released. So first off, security, as always, really important, but also really do pay attention to your due diligence. Um, interestingly, also um, on, on this press statement, they mentioned the cooperation with the ICO, although given it's a 3% uh, global worldwide turnover fine they were intending, I, I dread to think what it would have been otherwise. But the, the real lesson here that we can take to heart um, is around due diligence, but particularly where you've got a big company or a big group acquiring a smaller organization and that small, or, that small company has a big problem. It's then not just a problem shared, but it's actually a problem magnified. And that's because when looking at fines, regulators will look at your, your group's worldwide global turnover. So that can significantly increase the, the fine that you could actually get. Again, this is one that where we were due a decision in uh, March, that's the extended time frame, and it's been further extended due to COVID. So again, it'll be interesting to see whether that um, the fine if there is one is reduced because actually you know the hotel industry and, um, and leisure industry they've been very hard hit during the pandemic. Now there's some interesting um, figures that come out of the um, the breach survey from 2020 that Phil mentioned earlier on specifically relating to cyber security risks and due diligence. And, and what came out of that, as you can see on this slide here, in terms of businesses overall, 
it's actually only 15% um, sort of really doing their due diligence on their immediate suppliers, and then only 9% on their wider supply chain. And if we take a look at the, you know, one of the higher figures, so within larger organisations, and, and here I, you would expect they've got bigger budgets for this as well, but it's it's 43% for immediate supply chain and 25% for the wider supply chain. Now. I actually, and it is higher than the from business overall, but it's still not that high. So organisations at the moment probably are not doing enough due diligence. And I'll hand over to Saba. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, so to sort of follow on from what Kirsten has said, we're just looking at a high level now across other lessons that we've learned from breaches across Europe. Now, having insufficient technical and organisational measures to ensure the security of data can be you know, quite complicated. Um, however, what we picked up on was that organisations are still feel, um, failing on the basics. So implementing appropriate access controls. This is generally quite a simple um, technical measure to, to put in place. If you, as an employee in an organization, do not need access to all of the data that the organization has, then you know there has to be access controls in place that prevent you from even by accident seeing that sort of information a classic example in an organization is hr data it's not something we're all um, privy to that information and the access controls should reflect that the second is to do with websites and something we see quite often actually is um, not securing the websites from known vulnerabilities and websites often are compromised from you know just the, the you know the sql injections and you think well this is quite a simple thing that could have been put in place um if we translate this to systems systems tend to have patches every so often you should um, download updates and we have seen scenarios where sort of years have gone by or a significant period of time has gone by and no sort of system refresh has been done no sort of updates have been installed and these two regulators even the ico were very 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 common failings and this is where organizations are likely to be criticized if they notify a breach as a result of something like this uh, the, the third one here is i have to say a personal interest of mine so reducing the risk of mass data exfiltration so we see, and this has two limbs um, that I'm going to sort of take you through. Now, the first is, and let's go back to the um, phishing example, as 57% of you have said you've dealt with a phishing attack or suffered a phishing attack in the last year, so it's quite relevant. Um, so if a bad actor has had access to your system as someone's fallen victim of a phishing attack, they may obviously try and access or perhaps download your data. Now, if someone's able to get access to your system and make a mass download of your data, that's very, very concerning to me, especially if your systems have not picked up any sort of red flags or triggers um, to say, well, actually, this is activity that's out of the ordinary. I, I know I'm speaking about it in a really basic sort of sense, as opposed to a very technical sense here, but it's... Um, there should be some sort of red flag triggers which show unusual activity in your systems and that should prompt your IT security team to investigate and put a stop to it where they can. So that's one element of it. Now the other element is we've often dealt with um, data breaches where our clients have suffered a phishing attack and they just don't know what data the bad actor has seen whether it's you know them clicking through certain emails in a mailbox or whether they've gone into a system and done a mass download because there's absolutely no um, logging information or if it is it's not granular enough to actually pinpoint what was done with the data now in this scenario unfortunately what ends up happening is organizations will have to assume the worst possible case scenario that this bad actor could have seen every single data record in this system they had access to and notify the regulator on that basis. And if you had the right sort of access control, um, right sort of logs and you know they were granular enough for you to actually paint a picture to the regulator and say, yes, there was a bad actor they did have access to the systems. However, our logs actually show they actually didn't get to the data 
therefore you, you may even find yourself where you actually think well what's the risk and going through the thresholds to notify you may take a view as to whether you notify or not so that's that's one interesting one that we see quite often the fourth one was uh, we came across some examples of breaches where organizations have all the right processes and procedures in place they've just not followed them when it's come to investigating a breach or even preventing a breach and again that's so a very basic thing to be able to do and sort of a very um, unfortunate issue to fall foul of. Um, there was another um, case where in fact there was a breach and very detailed forensic evidence was taken however it wasn't retained and therefore there was nothing for there to be used when it came to an investigation. And the last one here is implement encryption. Even before the GDPR regulators such as the ICO always spoke about encryption. Now, the one point I'd say about encryption is it's just not good enough um, simply saying, yes, we have encryption. Look at your data and assess whether that encryption is high level enough to protect the data in question. Um, because there are different varying levels of encryption. The stronger the encryption, the better it is. Now, I have flown through these um, lessons learned from other breaches, but you, if you are interested in finding out a bit more information about this, then a couple of weeks ago, Kirsten and I did a data breach um, SOS training session, which is available on our YouTube channel under the Data Protection Get Fit series. Um, so it's called Data Protection SOS, and it's where you can get more information on these measures and other items that would help you deal with the breach. We essentially take you through a 10 step process um, on how to deal with a breach so that's there if it's of interest to you. Now lessons learned again continuing on lessons learned from other breaches ac across Europe. Now Kirsten's already gone through one of the aggravating factors and that was not um, cooperating with a the regulator. There is an example of a breach actually that the ICO um, um, in, um, issued an enforcement action against and that was where the ICO have written a number of times um, to the organisation requesting information, requesting for them to cooperate and they, the organisation just hasn't engaged. Um, the other two items which are considered to be aggravating factors are failing to notify a notifiable breach. So again, the table I took you through earlier is very important in Allow, enabling you to assess whether a breach is notifiable and where there's a significant delay in notifying. And again, I want to emphasize this, especially now in the time of the um, pandemic. So even though the ICO has said they may take a, symp a sympathetic and proportionate view um, so far as delaying notification or late notification is concerned, obviously significantly delaying notification is in itself an aggravating factor. And then the last slide here, looking at trends, is to do with insurance. Um, now, obviously, post GDPR, or in fact, even um, prior to it slightly, when talking about cyber, one of the topics that was discussed quite a lot was cyber insurance. Um, however, when looking at these stats um, prepared by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, um, they don't seem to correlate sort of again the discuss the level of discussion and um, attention cyber insurance was given the uptake has been very low so for businesses overall only four percent of businesses have actually taken out specific cyber security insur um, insurance and for only 28 percent of businesses cyber security cover is only part of a wider insurance policy um, so again, it will be interesting to see sort of over the next couple of years as we see more fines and we see what happens with cases like, you know, BA and Marriott, what sort of impact that would have um, in organisations trying to protect their position um, and cyber insurance may be one thing in which they try and use that to do. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Phil to sum up and go through the conclusions. Lovely, thank you, Saba. Um, so we're going to move on to to questions in just a moment. But before we do, and by the way, if you do have any questions, and now's the time to to slip them into the question box, and we will do our best to answer them in a moment. Um, but before we do, let's just look at what we can conclude from today's session. So, firstly, 
we have seen that fines for data, data protection breaches generally, but including security breaches, are on the rise, both in terms of volume and value. And indeed, I think if we do see that the Marriott and the BA fines are realized at anywhere near the levels the ICO was originally considering, then we will see an even bigger spike in the, the value of uh, data breach fines that are being imposed. <clears throat> We have seen that internal and external threats to personal data are on the rise. So we have seen the risks arising from things like phishing, from human error, from uh, from hackers, all of those kinds of things. But you know, as looking at some of the slides that Saba has just been going through, many organisations are still failing on even uh, basic security measures. Um, we're also seeing that there's not enough security due diligence going on at the time of M&A. And remember, of course, that you know one of the things you need to be very careful of if you're buying an organization is that you buy something that has some kind of toxic um, cybersecurity issue that you will be acquiring as the purchaser of that business. Think about some of the value that was written off Yahoo's business with some of the issues that were discovered there. Um, preparation is key. Um, you, it's, it's not just a question of having appropriate technical security in place, but that needs to be combined with appropriate organizational measures. And really, you're thinking there about the policies you have in place to handle security and respond to incidents, the processes accompanying those policies, and frankly, people. Do, people, do you have a culture of security? Do the people have awareness of the risks? Are you training them and educating them? All of these things are very, very important, as is fast and effective mitigation. You know, if you uh, once you experience a, a cyber incident, you need to be able to respond rapidly to that. And it's intimately related to the previous point, because if you don't have those technologies, those policies, those processes, the data response teams in place, your ability to mitigate these kinds of incidents is going to be severely impaired. And consequently, the, the impacts of any kind of breach are going to be that much greater. Um, the experiences we've seen to date is that some of the fines that are being imposed could have been lower or potentially even non-existent, but for some of the aggravating factors. And we have seen in particular that cooperation with the data protection authorities is key. And interestingly, for all the noise you hear about cybersecurity insurance, it is not a matter of course yet. There are still the majority of businesses have not got any kind of cybersecurity insurance cover, whether that's a specific policy or as part of a wider um, uh, wider policy coverage. Maybe that's due to a lack of products on the market. Maybe it's like due to a lack of awareness. You know, but whatever it happens to be, cybersecurity insurance has not yet taken off in the way that you would expect. So we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, I feel like this is the point at which I should be playing sort of mastermind music, or maybe who wants to be a millionaire. Uh, but we'll kick off <clears throat> with the first question. Uh, which relates to liability caps in terms of data protection breaches. Um, obviously, a very contentious issue in a lot of commercial deals as to who bears um, what liability and what the value of the liability cap is. So the question we have is, in terms of managing risk contractually, are you seeing any shift in the market with regard to acceptance of unlimited liability or super caps in respect of data protection breaches? Um, Kirsten, maybe I'll pass that one to you to begin with. Um, yeah, um, so I, I would say that um, I don't think there is a completely um, settled way of dealing with this, this in contracts. Um, what we actually originally saw when GDPR came in is that um, if you're the customer or the controller, the liability caps um, that you want are non-existent and um, that was being requested regularly. Um, but then you had this push-pull because the, the process or service provider is completely at the other end of the spectrum, very, very conscious of the increased risk under GDPR um, and is actually trying to go completely the other way and, and lower their liability caps. So I, I think that push-pull is still going on, um, and I don't think there's an absolutely settled um, way of doing things. Um, but generally speaking, what I think we are seeing is there is a rise in liability caps specifically for data protection related issues. Um, and what we saw developing is what's called like a super cap, which is like a ring fenced pot of liability, which relates specifically to data protection. 
And I shall just add one more thing, which is not related to liability caps, but but what I'm what I still regularly see, and, and uh, Sabra and Phil, please do contribute. But I'm still also regularly seeing in um, liability clauses this sort of hidden little um, get out of jail free card, where so you you work very hard to agree your liability caps, um, but then somewhere in the small print it says, and we accept no liability for loss of data, which of course can um, you know ride a, a horse or some coach right through all of that. So that's one to watch out for. I have to agree. I always strike that one out whenever I see it myself. The, the other thing I would mention, um, really not specific to security breaches, but to, to data protection breaches generally, is that uh, a few months back, I ran a survey of a number of different um, cloud-based vendors. And one of the things we were looking at as part of that survey was what was the value of liability caps that they were accepting in contracts. And, you know, exactly to your point, Kirsten, we did find there was a variety of different positions. But for cloud-based vendors, the majority of positions we saw tended to indicate that most vendors will tie their liability to a multiple of the annual service fees they get. Um, the greatest number would be in the range of three to four times their annual service fees. Um, uh, you know, and and... and that was as far as they go. Now, obviously, if you're paying a vendor 50,000, 100,000 pounds a year, obviously the potential liability they're then offering you under a cap is significantly lower than the 2% or 4% you may potentially face under the GDPR. So I think we do, still do see a big disconnect between the potential GDPR liabilities and the liabilities that vendors will accept. But perhaps related to that, and maybe another question for you, Kirsten, is, um, one of the things you'll often hear in contract negotiations is the process processors will often say to you well we don't need to give you a bigger liability cap because if we have a breach the regulator will come after us they won't go after you how much comfort do you think data controllers can take from that um i don't think they can take that much comfort from that actually phil because our experience and, and sabra's experience uh, will be the same um is that um, quite often the regulator is is looking to the controller um, in terms of incidents that happen and those incidents may well have been caused by a processor um, you know there are plenty of examples of those where it's actually somewhere in the supply chain that the incident is caused but the regulator still looks to the controller because ultimately the controller still has these obligations under the GDPR to make sure it's choosing the right processes, it's doing its due diligence, it's putting its article 28 clauses in place and um, you know making sure that not, not just its own security is right but also the security of its providers. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I suppose that you can always, you know, exactly to your point, you can always say that if a processor had an incident, then maybe the controller was asleep on the job, it hadn't done enough due diligence, it hadn't been carrying out its audits properly and so on. Um, yeah, yeah. it's not to say they can't go after the processor as well, but, um, you know, I, I, I definitely think you should um, you know, be worried if you're the controller and your, your processor causes an incident. Thank you. Saba, a question for you um, that's come in. How important is trying to mitigate the potential risk of harm to data subjects? That, that would be extremely important. As we saw earlier, um, you will have to notify individuals in the event that there's a high risk of harm to them. Therefore, the more you can mitigate that, especially at those initial stages as to where the breach um, has occurred, you may get to a point where you think, well, OK, this harm no longer actually exists to the individual, so therefore we're exempt from um, notifying them. Also, I think in light of um, the rise in class actions, um, you know, and looking at some of the points Kirsten raised in, in the cases earlier, and um, when I went through the trends, something I had picked up was that a lot of these trends um, a lot of the enforcement action, aside from breaches, also relates to where data subjects make complaints and feel their rights have been breached. So it's, I think it's imperative um, to mitigate that risk um, to them. I think when dealing with data subjects as well in the context of a breach, you want to be as helpful as possible. Um, I think ignoring that element or not doing enough could lead you in more trouble afterwards. So it's, it's, it's crucial. Thank it's you. a vital part of your process. Thank you. I suppose related to that, I mean, you, you've 
um, you mentioned kind of assessing the risk in order to determine whether you have to report to a regulator or whether you have to report to the data breaches that, uh, sorry, the data subjects that are affected by the incident, you know, it's quite a, um, quite a vague concept, isn't it, to say, you know, something is unlikely to result in a risk or something is a high risk. I mean, do either of you have any thoughts on how you decide, how you quantitatively assess whether something is risky enough to merit reporting? So there's a lot of guidance on this at the moment. For, well, not a lot. There's some guidance that um, from INISA, uh, which actually gives you some examples, and it takes you through a methodology in terms of how you assess the risk of harm. And you look at various components as to how the breach occurred, how much it's affecting individuals, what the likely impact to them will be, um, how that's been mitigated. And it's about then sort of putting all those pieces together and making, taking a view. So it's almost like a matrix that, that that's given at the moment. Um, another thing that I do when working on breaches as well is think about is there a similar breach that's been in the public domain or a regulator has talked about it and that also then helps inform um, the risk assessment but I think definitely the guidance from Inisa is um, important here. Kirsten did you want to add anything to that? Yeah so just to add to that so um, Anisa, that's the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity um, and this guidance is a guidance that was published it's quite some years ago so about 10 years ago um, but actually this is the um, guidance that's referred to in the European Data Protection Board guidance on um, notification of security breaches so there's the, 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 the board has issued this guidance which has got some useful information in it as well and they specifically uh, mentioned this ANISA guidance and the ANISA guidance is, is quite robust um, in, in the way it categorizes risk so you know low sort of high medium what, what have you and um, it, it's very useful um, although what I would say about the ANISA guidance is that it allocates scores to the risk so there's a formula sort of a formula it's not a real one um, uh, by which you um, try to allocate risk to an incident um, so we we've got our own methodology at Field Fisher for helping clients assess risk and we've incorporated the ANISA guidance into that but we don't do the scoring and the reason for that is that um, it's a bit dangerous to give a figure um, to a risk because there's always the there's the risk that if you're very close to the edge in terms of numbers that you're sort of under go down in terms of figures um, and really a lot of this is it's it's not that scientific it's really about uh, applying common sense as well so it's, it's an art rather than a science yes exactly well put <laughs> <laughs> um good uh, one other thing you often see in contracts is, is the kind of the, the back and forth between controllers and processors in terms of um, when a processor experiences an incident how quickly it has to inform the controller about that and often that seems to be driven by a concern by controllers that they only have 72 hours to report an incident to the regulators themselves um, is that right when does when does that 72 hour clock begin for the controller when it's the processor who's actually had the incident yeah sure so it um, so you uh, the, the 72 hour clock starts when you become aware of the incident um, so if the processor hasn't told you, um, then you're not aware of the incident. But that doesn't mean that your processor can take as long as it likes or um, that, uh, you know, you want to be encouraging your processor to never tell you about incidents. So um, the, the processor has a direct obligation under the GDPR to notify the controller of incidents and they're required to do that without undue delay. So there's not like a 72 hour provision. It, it's just without undue delay. So the pro the processor, you know, they they may take a little bit of time, and and this is perfectly fine. And they say this in the guidance from the European Data Protection Board. You know, they they may well be looking at whether has there actually been a security incident. Uh, that's fine. Um, but once they know about it, they have to tell the controller. And then once the controller is aware of the incident, that's when the clock starts. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I think we're just coming up on the hour here. So I think this is a good place to, to wrap up today's session. Um, I, I would just like to say thank you to both Kirsten and Saba and the marvellous um, Phil Fisher events team for putting on today's event and doing so much research and sharing so much wonderful knowledge with everybody who has attended today's call. Um,
we hope you found it very useful. If you have any questions, do of course please reach out, and we will be sharing both copies of the slides and uh, and a recording of today's session um, in due course. And you have all of our contact details up here on the screen right now, along with our very handsome pictures.